for SME bosses, they face a lot of challenges hiring locals. So one of the programs that we recently rolled out and it will be launched in November officially is this program called Overseas Markets Immersion Program. So it supports businesses uh, to send their locals, whether it's Singaporeans or PRs, without relevant experience out to the market and then bring it back to your company to groom the next generation of leaders. I think that's so important to maintain Singapore's key advantage. Most of us don't realise the future is actually already here. Okay, welcome back to TSC Business Show. I'm your host, Reggie, aka your Chief Financial Coconut. And today, we are talking about a very, very important topic. Lah, okay, I think this whole distributed workforce environment is a new frontier. For a lot of Singapore companies, um, I think it's a kind of a Pandora's box that you open post-COVID. La. Then people start thinking like, it actually can. But as you open up, you realise actually also a lot of problems. <laughs> right? it's, it's not so simple. So we are here to discuss and I'm joined Heikel. For our audience that don't know you, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, hi guys. Uh, my name is Heikel. I also host podcasts, but here today, I'm just helping Reggie. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and, you know, I'm here to also talk about these very important topics like, because I was, I'm also here to learn. Uh, I also work in the private sector, so I do have experience in this a little bit. So maybe I want to hear what our speakers have to share and also yeah, be But to set the ground, you also have a distributed team, right? Yes, in I do. In different I do. parts I do, of I do, I do, I do. ASEAN yeah, so Yeah, it's distributed around Southeast Asia and we want to try to make it work as best as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that's all, all entrepreneurs want that. Right, so uh, with our set, you are, we have two uh, esteemed speakers. Oh, wow. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, your hit rate very high. Right? Oh, your download number is very good. That's <laughs> how so you get Come back again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For somehow our audience still don't know you, you want to introduce yourself. Thanks a lot, Reggie. Uh, so I'm Prelim. I'm commercial director at Glins. Glins is a Singapore headquartered venture capital back. HR business. We're actually regional, so we also have a distributed team, but we are very much in the business of actually helping, especially Singapore-based businesses, to build distributed teams in Southeast Asia. So that's part and parcel of our day-to-day. Uh, -day. Yeah. I think that's the core, not part and parcel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's like your, your, your core offering, right? And we will discuss correct, that correct. as we go along. Yeah, yes, yeah. And we have Shirley. You want to introduce yourself yeah. for our audience? My name is Shirley. I'm from Workforce Singapore. I come from a group called Enterprise Development, and our main role is to support businesses in Singapore in their workforce matters. So ranging from reskilling, upskilling, recruitment matters as well. Oh, okay. Support okay. businesses. Yeah, support businesses. Know. What does it mean? Uh? Can you explain a little <laughs> bit like what, what does supporting businesses today mean? Okay, so we try to understand what businesses are going through in terms of their business needs, their workforce challenges that they face and then see how we can gather support especially in the area of incentives to encourage them to grow their businesses, to make jobs better to reskill and upskill their workers so that they have growth skills and of course they can command higher salary. So in the space of like manpower right, or do we still use manpower or we call it talent pool? In the space of talent pool what are some struggles that SME bosses are experiencing? Because you are in contact with so many of them right? So can share a little bit? I think for SME bosses they face a lot of challenges hiring locals right? Singaporeans, PRs because they tend to have the perspective that SME unlike MNCs, their brand is less known. For SME, you really have to cover many functions. I like specialized functions. That's why in SMEs, you don't call multi-hatter. Everybody is multi-hatting all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's not a so bad a thing because for the individual, you really acquire different kind of skills across different functions and it can be very exciting, right? To learn the various type of businesses. Okay, okay, great, great. So maybe we can kind of open up the floor a little bit. What is your experience, you know, in managing a distributed workforce? For me, I was helping the business that I work with really put people on the ground across Southeast Asia because we needed, needed people on the ground to be able to talk to our local stakeholders, right? And we needed that face time. We needed to make sure that the business has a face on the ground as well. But as things went by, I saw that Okay, it was not just these particular roles that were going to be hired elsewhere. So those are client facing. Yeah, right? yeah those okay. are client facing. Those are the ones that, okay, we know that we people need no to talk to people. Ah. Yes, right, yeah, we have yeah, to we have, we to, have, to, have, have to, those, yes. right? But then after that, suddenly it became the other roles also. Lah. <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly the other roles that we thought like, okay, it's a little bit more difficult to hire in Singapore. Let's try. Since we already have the company incorporated elsewhere, let's see whether we can try hire for these roles elsewhere. We tried one. Then after that, it quite good. 
We tried to hire another one and it became a proper team then being built elsewhere in across Southeast Asia like, regionally. But I was wondering whether, is this actually something that's quite common around it's businesses? It's hubbing, right, essentially. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. quite common. So actually your experience is probably quite typical of a lot of SMEs in Singapore. Yeah. When you start to think about hiring distributors, distributors are a fancy term. Like, just like you say it's new, actually it's not a new word for something that's been happening. The first use case is what Heiko was talking about. Usually it's, I need to go expand and I need to have people on the ground to meet the customer. Very obvious use case. The second one is save money. And why is that? Because you're taking advantage of wage arbitrage. Singapore versus wage cost in different parts of the nearby region. So in Indonesia or Vietnam or Philippines versus Singapore, like for like, there's probably an arbitrage that you can benefit from. But I think what you're talking about, right, is that I think post-COVID, actually in the second one, it starts to evolve a little bit more from like, hey, it's not just about saving money. You start to realize, hey, because there's some roles that are very difficult to find in Singapore, you can actually find, and now we're, because when we talk about saving money and efficiencies, right, usually people immediately think of like the most mechanical and most junior roles. So customer service or like uh, operational, administrative, back office, right? Paperwork sort of stuff. But then you start to realize, hey, hold on. You start to explore Indonesia a bit more. You explore Vietnam or Philippines or Malaysia a bit more. And especially in this last few years, the talent quality has actually gone up a lot. So the skills have improved a lot. And what that actually gives you is more options. So now it's not just the most mechanical roles that you're pushing out. You're actually looking, hey, you know, there's some, uh, for example, in the software side, application development, you can actually get some pretty good people in the region. You start to look at marketers, digital side especially. Event marketing, you still need to be pretty much on the ground, onshore. But if you talk about digital stuff, performance marketers, or even the creatives to support that, actually the quality is there. Then you start to say, oh, that's exactly as Heiko says, there's an option. So it's becoming more of a norm now. The awareness is coming up and people are saying, hey, okay, I can actually build teams in and around the region to support my business in Singapore. How does that affect the talent pool here yeah. though? Right? That's why workforce so, Singapore yeah. very stressed. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, we can see that talent is improving elsewhere. How are we keeping up to make sure that we still can land jobs here, basically? I wanted to highlight two points and share a story as well. I was talking to a Singapore brand in a space of electronics. And he mentioned that he had challenges hiring customer service reps in Singapore. The first layer of customer service team, he built it up in Philippines. But he said that that's not because it was intentional. It was because he couldn't get Singaporeans. And therefore, what you said about identifying the job role, the critical job role is very important, right? And he said that the Singapore layer plays a very important part because for customer service, if you have any problems with your products, and you are talking to a Singaporean, your Singaporean will not be very happy to talk to somebody in the Philippines. And that Filipino might not know the context of, for example, a four-room flat, HDB flat in Singapore, five-room flat. So I think local market knowledge is very important, mm. right? The cultural affinity is very important as well. So identifying this job goal to be based in Singapore, I think is something that businesses need to think about. And then encouraging SME or businesses to go overseas to build up the team, it is good. It's sustainability in the longer term. But I think it's also good to think about which Singaporean or which local core you want to send over because it represents your brand, it represents a culture that you want to build over there. And within the government space, there are a lot of incentive support programs to encourage companies to do that. So one of the programs that we recently rolled out and it will be launched in November officially is this program called Overseas Markets Immersion Program. So it supports businesses uh, to send send their locals, whether it's Singaporeans or PRs, without relevant experience out to the market to grow their businesses. And the support is in the area of salary as well as allowance. If the businesses send these employees to be located in one city for at least six months, we support up to nine months, up to 70% of their salary and up to 70% of monthly allowance capped at $3,000. Oh, that's really good. Oh. There you go. There you go. There you go. Okay, I think my guy's going to sign up for this. It's like, hey, boss can send me Thailand. <laughs> so yeah, the salary is capped at 5000 but up to 70%. 70%, 5000 cap, and then there's still an allowance on top of it. Yeah, over a period of nine months. Wow. So I think it's something to encourage businesses 
to take advantage of this to send your Singaporeans or PRs out to help you build your business in that local market. Okay, these numbers, right, they don't come from the sky. There must be some scoping on this, right? So 5,000, we are looking at the median wage in Singapore. So are we targeting at like middle managers in the SME space? You know, they kind of make about that. We're trying to push them out to get a regional exposure, is that? This program is open to anyone who has worked in the industry for two years. So if you're talking about fresh grads and they have gone out to the industry to work for two years and your company thinks that this person is a potential leader for your company and you want to send out for overseas exposure, uh, you may do so. So it's a broad-based uh, workforce program to develop anyone who has more than two years of experience. And but, there's, but no there's, no, there's no upper limit, right? No, no, no age cap. Interesting, interesting. What's okay. the idea behind that, Shirley, in, tr- in terms of helping Singapore companies place locals elsewhere, what do you hope to achieve from that? We want to build a pool of locals who are globally competitive. Whether it's your SMEs or your MNCs, you want Singaporeans or your PRs to be able to contribute and to compete globally, right? They have the skill sets to take the company to greater heights, right? And to help them to expand as well. Yeah, yeah. But you still want them to come home, right? Eventually. <laughs> uh, we actually leave it to the company whether you want to base the person there or to bring the person back after two to three years. And the key point is to expose this person, right? So that he or she have the relevant skills to compete and to grow as an individual as well as to grow the business. Fair, fair. And I think building on that point, a lot of SME Taukes also say like, I want to do this business in Cambodia. I want to do this business, you know, in Thailand, but I cannot be based there all the time. So I need to bring trusted Singaporeans to go there to lead. And actually, they also struggle to find people that can do that. It's not as big a talent pool, not that don't have, right? And when the talent pool is small, it's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you always have to pay a premium, right? When uh, supply and demand. So I think a part of doing this could probably open up that pool. So more Singaporeans have a general sense. So, oh, I've done a two year stint in Thailand. I've done a one year stint in Indonesia. I have a little bit more experience around. Easier to kind of bring the next batch of Singapore companies you know, around. So you talk about the pool of job seekers or employees might not have the relevant experience, right? And therefore, this program, Overseas Market Immersion Program, actually encourages businesses to look for people without relevant experience. I think for employers, they like to take a plug and play approach. They want the perfect fit, but you know, in a manpower constrained economy, right? You sometimes cannot get the right fit. And to widen your manpower pool option we are saying that as long as this person has potential have good attitude have soft skills that's transferable domain knowledge can be built right give that person an opportunity and government is here to defray your operating costs in a sense because we know that the person might not be able to straight away contribute immediately and the person needs to be reskilled or upskilled in certain manner right and therefore the salary support is there for that purpose and that essentially is trying to build the Singapore core right but what is the Singapore core today right because like what you said a lot of these even so-called higher skilled talent things our neighbours all can do Mm. these days right so even on our own end a lot of technical functions you know uh, have been kind of moved abroad so what then is the Singapore core from your experience working with so many companies so actually I'm very aligned with what Shirley was sharing right because I don't think it's about substitutive. It's complementary, actually. I think of the distributor or the regional workforce as a like a force multiplier for Singapore businesses, the SMEs. When you talk about expansion, that's a very easy way to think about it. Expanding, you're actually magnifying or amplifying your business. But even when you talk about pushing certain, as you say, technical functions out, right? Even if the higher order skills today are becoming more available in the region, I still think of it as a force multiplier. It simply implies that the nature of the work in Singapore right, has to evolve. I say this, right? Honestly, I think it's not just about distributor of regional workforces. It's also with the increasing automation, right? AI and whatnot, and all that's going on. That These are mega trends. These are happening, right? So as these things go on, whether it's rising talent quality and talent skills in the region and or rising use of automation, the challenge it imposes on the Singapore core, and it would be great to hear Shelley's view on this. I think actually it, it requires the roles and the talent here even evolve more towards things like uh, critical thinking, leadership, effective communication, problem solving, and creativity. Yeah, but these things, right, have been 
stock of the town for like 15, 20 years, right? Why is he still lacking, you know? I don't think it's lacking. And you mentioned that for regional talent, their skills are increasingly getting better. And therefore, Singapore also needs to level up in terms of our workforce skills, right? So we're emphasizing a lot on growth skills. At Workforce Singapore, we have actually collaborated with uh, different agencies to mount the jobs transformation map. Basically, this... JTM, I call it in short form, highlights the different trends, challenges that different sectors are facing, the kind of jobs that will be impacted currently, as well as the emerging jobs, right? And it highlights how you need to redesign those jobs that are impacted by trends, technology, changing consumer preferences, business processes. So those jobs that are highly impacted need to be redesigned. And it talks about how the business should be redesigning a particular role and what are the skill sets that they should be equipping their employees with. So we have 23 sectors and we are rolling out jobs transformation maps. So it's a very good document to showcase you know, the different kind of trends, challenges and how businesses should respond. So we are leveling up the skills of the Singaporean core as well. I can share a couple of stories as well. I mean, maybe one from a startup and then one from a larger enterprise because Glenn's obviously we we work with a lot of such companies, right, in helping them design and construct such solutions. So if I start with the startup, I think I can name them. So I think everyone might be quite familiar with GetGo. They are a big car sharing app these days, right? You see the cars going around. Their product and engineering leadership sits in Singapore. And largely Singaporean over here, yeah? So that's a call for them. The creativity and the critical thinking around like what needs to be built, the roadmap design and all that, that's set here. However, a significant proportion of their software team actually being managed by us. We help them hire, build a site for them, put a team there and then handle all the HR matters of that in Indonesia. And that works for them, right? So it's a complementary thing. It's a force multiplier. It helps them to do it cost efficiently. Of course, that's a plus, but it's no longer just about cost efficiency. It's also about what value do you want the people in Singapore to create? Thus, getting them to handle just the coding is that the value you want? Or do you want your HR team in Singapore to be handling all the payroll matters of these? Is that the value? Or do you want them to be thinking about things like the product roadmap on the side, on the HR side, maybe the culture? I think a larger enterprise, right? So it's not just the startups who are thinking this way. So we work for one of the largest financial services, insurance companies, right? In Singapore, multinational. I won't name them. But there are only those few. La. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess that. You can choose that. You try, you try. You know. La. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. These days, the customer-facing applications that they have on, you know, and most commonly is about Claims, right? Making your claims experience easy. So they had a relaunch of this uh, last year and, you know, it's a vastly improved experience. And you look at it and then you think, hey, who's the one who's building this? Again, it's a tech team. The thought leaders are here in Singapore. That's the engineering leadership. That's the business side. That's the product side. But then the building team, the coders, and this is everyone from your front end to your full stack guys and your quality assurance guys to make sure it's bug free and all that. Those guys are in Indonesia and it works, right? And it's a better experience, it's a better outcome for the business ultimately here in Singapore. I can add to that, right? In the beginning, I think Shirley was talking about how SMEs, you know, your brand is not very big. So you struggle to get the best talent. That is the truth, right? In a landscape where you have management trainee program, you have this, that, all the big brands, big bands, they all come in. I always find it very hard to get the best people. But when I start to explore the technical team in other parts of the region, I can afford a slight premium to make up for the lack of brand affinity locally. Because over there also got big brands, right? Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Of course. But because I'm not as big, but because of that wage compression that I can subject but that I job to. I would say to, it's even more than that because I would say thanks to Singapore government mainly. Yeah. Actually, Singapore as a brand is very powerful in the region. I've cross-checked with a few people. Yes, like it yeah. is. Right? <laughs> Yesterday, all the panels, I asked so yeah. how you go Middle East, Singapore, good? So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They also <laughs> like that. So, and sometimes we hear, 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 we don't know if it's true, right? But then you listen from some of the hear SMEs. Hear it from the horse's mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they say, yeah, it's true. So it's interesting. And, yeah, and yeah. to the talent pool, right? I mean, to a, again, I use Indonesia as an example, right? To a, a young graduate today from the top tier universities in Indonesia, this is the likes of UI, University Indonesia, or Bandung Institute of Technology. These are the best schools and the cream of the crop, right? You know, you give them an opportunity to work for a Singapore-based business. It's exciting. It's aspirational. Very, very attractive, right? It's very attractive. Even from your experience? I think so too. I think whenever we offer something, we tell people that we are a Singapore company, right? And there's an opportunity to work for a foreign company. It's become a lot more attractive. They sometimes also increase their asking. They're asking uh, a yeah, bit higher. Asking, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, but it's not about the asking, right? Ultimately, it's about the type of quality yes, of work yes, that comes yes, out of yes, it, right? Yeah. And you'd be surprised sometimes the quality of work is just impossible to beat, you know? 
know. Right, I, right, it's I very agree. Hard. And I wonder, like, in terms of how we are now, like you guys said, uh, is a transformation of that job role and the job seekers in Singapore and that talent pool in Singapore in terms of evolving their skills and all that. How do they then make sure while they are evolving that they're not losing out to this regional talent pool then, right? So it's important to make sure that we have that Singapore core. But while they are evolving, what do we do then to make sure that we are relevant and we can actually stay in our jobs? That's why it's important to send our local core out to different markets, right? To gain exposure, to be able to understand the markets, the challenges, and then the kind of environment that's evolving. And then bring it back to your company to groom the next generation of leaders. Yeah, I think that's so important to maintain Singapore's key advantage, right? But are there enough of these roles that you think that could actually be filled elsewhere for Singaporeans to actually take up these skills and all that. Are there these opportunities that are out there at the moment? I think that one uh, must be led by Singapore companies. <laughs> right? Because the whole idea is the yeah, Singapore companies so want to go out. And from the SBF yeah, right, MTI right. report, right, it all shows that Singapore companies want to go out. They have to go out to be yeah. sustainable in the longer term. The business landscape has reached a point where it's very mature. Yeah. If you want to grab a bigger pie, you go out, right? And and so many of my friends, they run lean and mean companies, you know, and start really fast. And they grow dominant into you know, there's a whole business landscape out there that's much bigger. But I think EDB is also doing a good job. You know, you talk about MNCs, right? When they woo the MNCs to Singapore, I think one of the key thinking is also to get the MNCs to develop your Singaporean core, right? And giving them the opportunity to go out and be exposed. Yeah, yeah. But the Singapore core that work at MNC don't really want to work for SME. <laughs> right, uh, different level. But, but this one, different level. But this one is a personal Depending choice. Depending on right? life uh, stages. Uh, 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 like what I said, SME offers good ground for different kind of exposure, different kind of jobs, which can be very exciting rather than a very specialized one. It's true. It's so true. it really depends on what the individual is yeah. looking for at the career stage yeah, of their and, life. And sometimes I hear SME Tauke say things like, yeah, train, train, train. After a few years, I'll join MNC. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you know yeah, it's, yeah. it's a thing but the truth of the matter is every industry is like that everywhere you go <laughs> yes. is like that mm, yeah. you must strategically recognize that you as a company you are small This you are the platform the people come in after they do a few years then they will go and join CNA yeah. right yeah. they will go and join unfortunately we are whatever. a stepping stone uh, uh. we are a stepping stone and it's fine as long as you are clear about it then you can plan the journey of the individual and you can maximize that training process. You know that this is what you're good for. Thanks, Rigi, for bringing that out. Oh. Because <laughs> I think we cannot expect someone to work in a company oh, for 10, oh. 20 years yeah. anymore, yeah, yeah. right? People are looking for new opportunities, exposure, but it's how you are retaining them as long as you can. So we're also encouraging companies to look at building the career health of the company. And what I mean by career health, it's not just your regular appraisal process whereby you assess whether whether the person has done the job well. Career health entails a bigger concept of really putting in place in a company structures to support career conver regular career conversations with your employees and individuals on their development, on their skills gap, on their strengths and where they can progress within the company. If you put that in place and you regularly engage your employees, hopefully they will think and they will know that you're investing in them, right? They're more willing to contribute to the company and stay longer within the company. For the, for the Gen Z professional, yeah, that's really important. I add on to that, right? One of the LinkedIn guys, Frank, that came out, right? He told me, right, Gen Z these days change out about nine months. Yeah. Nine, nine months, months is, a, uh. is a job change. Yeah, Last yeah. time when I put nine months in my CV, uh, that's a red flag. Hey, don't say it already. But it's an evolving, <laughs> it's an evolving ecosystem, <laughs> la, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, Glint, yeah, yeah. I think you know, right? We run this survey every year, talent report, right? And we speak to the respondents and all that to try to understand what's top of mind for them. I think top three things that come out, learning and development of career progression is really, really one of the top three. And now it's flexible work arrangements. Slightly controversial topic these days, I think. Yeah. The last one is a sense of culture, purpose. Yeah. So wanting to make an impact, right? I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just to clarify, I'm not saying Gen Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 just no, to clarify, I, I think what the data shows is the engagement of Gen Z workforce is to be different. It cannot be the same like 10, 20 years. You know, all the Taokes is from 10, 20 years ago, they Taoke, now they still Taoke, right? So a lot, of the, a lot of the SME bosses, they use the old method with the newer Gen Z's, which, which does not work. Work. And we can go into the nooks and crannies or the causality as to why it's like that, but not important, right? What's important is nine months. Within nine months, you must rotate them, right? You must kind of give them next level of engagement, next level of engagement. I yeah. think it's important to understand what this talent pool is actually looking for, right? Yeah, and yeah. the career health, that roadmap, if you actually then understand 
what they want to achieve in their career, what can you then give during that portion of their career in your company and making sure that you are tapping their skills for that particular period to its maximum. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure really it's as short as nine months. Glins have a different data set. <laughs> Fight. No, no, but this, this one's just sharing Glins ourselves. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. we are quite a young company as well. I think average age in Glins is definitely somewhere between 25 to 30. La, okay. And we have something we call tour of duty. Tour of duty is typically set between 24 to 36 months. But it's a conversation and agreement between the, the hiring manager and the employee. What do you want to achieve? And how do we align it with business goals? And let's make that happen for you in this committed period of time frame. And we check in to make sure that you're making progression on that. And this is not just about hitting your targets or whatever. It's about your career ambition. Then that's a stage. And then when we get to that stage, and then we say, okay, let's talk about your next tour. Yeah, so it's a commitment. Right? But at what size uh, can these sort of processes work? Or maybe is it just not as formal? I think the heart of it is whether you know the needs of the employee or not, right? I've seen several HR practitioners, very interesting. They are really looking at the way they hire and engage their employees, right? Instead of telling them, no, this job requires you to do this, 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 and clock in how many hours, they're saying, what is your need? I will change my job to suit your need if I do value you. Yeah. And that's a very interesting approach, right? That businesses should start looking at because today, your Gen Z is looking for fulfillment and engagement. Yeah. And a standardized job might not work for everybody. But that being said, I want to adjust the Gen Z mindset a bit. <laughs> right? You must have negotiating power. When you come into the interview, you can ask for the sky. Make sure you got something to give. Because the conversation... It's a little bit one way in my in my point of view these days, right? Which is like, oh, we keep telling companies, HR professionals, you must you know, be more flexible, which is well and good, right? But on the other end, you must come in with something, right? You must be able to show me that, oh, I can do this. I've done this, you know, on my own time out. You know, you don't do this call, right? I do this call, yeah. right? You don't do this thing. I know how to do this thing. Yeah. You know, so, so you must have something on the table to negotiate with. Don't just think, oh, because the big environment out there is like that, then you can just negotiate. You, you know what I mean? Something I do want to say though, I think uh, just to connect the dots a little bit back to what we were saying earlier. Yeah, the Singapore call. Yeah, and just now, and also you were asking the question like, at what size of company can you afford to have these conversations? I think it's precisely when you start to think about things like what is the Singapore call and what do you want your HR practitioners here to be actively thinking and spending time on? That's when your things like what tasks or jobs need to be automated, what tasks or jobs need to be distributed really connects the dots because if you can take payroll and you can take some admin stuff, put it out there and let either the system to settle it or another set of workers situated in a different location to take care of it in the region. Then over here, you have HR practitioners who are thinking about engagement, thinking about planning out career progression, thinking about culture, thinking about flexible work arrangements, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what the next generation of uh, leaders want to do also, right? They don't want to process payroll. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All this can automate. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, very, very interesting. And they want to elevate that status, I think, that, that Singapore Core has a elevated status, I mm. think, in, in the region as well. Yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. going back to that whole oh, suddenly that person is doing marketing for the entire region and all that. I think I, we've seen that happening for quite some time already in Singapore. And I think that's where people will try to keep on going. And for them to be able to hold those roles, as you said earlier, Shirley, I think people have to go out. I think businesses have to be open to let people go out and experience working elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. And also along the way, means we'll make mistake, lah, yeah, right? Cannot sure. one, right, right? You will sure. lose some money, you will make some business failures. It's okay. Yeah. Manage the risk and then we learn from there, right? Okay, maybe in, in closing, we go one round, you know, just to kind of share some quick, you know, uh, other things that you have not shared yet, you know, quick tidbits for SME Taukes to think of this Singapore call, you know, what is the next decade? How will it look like, you know? Yeah. yeah I think next uh, 10 years or so, I think people use this phrase, the future of work, right? And I think this is, a, I'm paraphrasing a quotation by someone more famous. <laughs> Most of us don't realize the future is actually already here, right? And I say that in the sense that when we talk about things like distributed workforces or really the increased use of automation, it is clear and present already here. If not, in your current job and your current business, I guarantee you for sure in the adjacent job function of business is already taking place in some shape or form. True. So there is an urgency to this, right? To business owners, whether you're SME Tauke or you're working for a larger enterprise as a function or business owner, actually, I don't think it's that big of a difference. I think you do need to be thinking about this. You need to be thinking about distributed workforces, automation, all that, not only from efficiency, you should think about it from value. Yeah, okay. In order not to sound very like pressure, right? yeah. like stress, huh? <laughs> don't do this, cannot. I think there's also an opportunity upside where you can kind of be more strategic with your capital, you know, arrangements. You can actually expand your margin and then you can invest in the faster growth spaces because to be fair, a lot of SME bosses, huh, they've been in the business for a while. 
they may be like in a oligopoly situation, you know, a few of the major people are here already. This thing will not grow further, you know, we're all kind of like, you are my client, I'm your client, right? Yeah. That kind of situation. If you can kind of unlock some margins, you can then use it to invest in higher yeah, growth nice. environment and then do that breakthrough. Especially a lot of second gen entrepreneurs, they take over their family's business. Look at it, oh my God, so <laughs> sad, right? So, so you must do some of these things to then be able to expand to the next level. I think it's a thing that you should do. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. For me, I just want to say, if we haven't emphasized it enough already, I, I feel that the Singapore talent pool is still very, very important. I think that we have what's there to offer that perhaps others in the region cannot offer. And I think we should not be easily overlooked just because of the bottom line, lah, because everywhere else is cheaper, <laughs> lah, right? But then I think we have an expertise, exposure, and perhaps a little bit of standing that perhaps the other markets will not be able to offer. That's not to say that it's not important to explore the other markets in terms of their talent pool, because I think they can offer extreme great value to Singapore businesses and businesses regionally. It's for true, that it's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fast, Fast multiplier. multiplier. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes. I just want to summarize and highlight three key points so that it's easier to remember. <laughs> the first is skills first hiring. The second one is a future ready workforce. The third one is career healthy workforce. What do I mean by skills first hiring is to really encourage SME businesses to widen your hiring pool, to look at skills first instead of a relevant experience, mm. looking for uh, people that can contribute rather than perfect fit. Mm. And there are a lot of support programs at WSG that could support the business. Future ready workforce. I want to encourage the SME businesses to really upskill and reskill your workforce in emerging growth skills, as well as growth skills outline earlier on that I mentioned to the jobs transformation maps. The third one is career healthy put in place a structure, processes to retain your employee, to groom your employee so that they will stay longer with you and to outline the progression pathways that they have within your company. Great, great, great. Thank you, thank you. I think we have to do more to understand the other interesting programs, right? So, so that's why another time. And with that, I think we've come to the end of today's uh, TFC Business Show. If you have any questions for them, put in the comment section. You can connect with them on LinkedIn. Bye! Thank you. Thank you.